Hello, everybody. You probably have heard about the GDPR, and even if you wouldn't be a hacker or IT nerd or whatever, you would have learned about GDPR because of all this cookie stuff happening in the browsers, well, on the websites, well, or not happening, or not correctly happening, or whatever. So um, we have Karl Kubitschek here, who will tell us a lot of those possible violations or correctness or incorrectness of these cookies, <laughs> cookie acceptance things. And he is a PhD student at the ETH Zurich. And have fun with his talk. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so this talk is actually something that we published and it's going to appear at this conference Usenix Security. And the main author is actually not me, but uh, Dino Bollinger, and he was the one who implemented the thing, so I want to give him the credits, but he cannot be here standing and presenting it. So, as was said, you've probably seen similar pop-ups as this one. And this one is very simple. It is not really giving you many choices. Um, it's just informing you that the cookies are being used for the best experience, whatever it means. Maybe the other extreme are such concerns that are so complicated, actually, that they contain hundreds of choices. This one is having 120 to 130 choices. And basically, this corresponds to every third party that is being included by the NZZ CH page. And uh, I don't want to shame here Noet Zürcher Zeitung. Actually, the guy who implemented this even wrote me that he's unhappy about this. Um, but uh, this is not something as outlier here. Uh, lots of websites are including 100 and more third parties. The outlier would be 200. Those are the extremes. But 100 is like still happening. Um, you probably know uh, these concerns, so Facebook and Google. And you would say that these companies are having enough uh, budget to have the developers to implement this correctly. And they probably have also the legal team to give the developers the expertise to do this properly. So they should be compliant. And uh, not really. They were fined just in January. 150 million euros for Google, 60 million for Facebook. So it means that even they cannot make it compliant. So probably it is rather the goal to not make it compliant than really not being able to do it properly. What I mean by this not compliant? So there are two regulations in play. I'm not going to overload you by the legal details, but just like just the surface. Uh, GDPR, most of you uh, heard, and the other that plays here a role is e-privacy directive. And uh, the e-privacy directive is actually the older one, so that one is defining what needs consent. And here it is stating that all but strictly necessary data processing needs consent. It's not speaking about cookies, even that sometimes it's called cookie law. It's not speaking about cookies at all. The technology doesn't matter. It is consent for data processing. So properly, these things should be called uh, data processing consents or tracking consents. But people would not probably agree with tracking. So actually, this is just euphemism to call it uh, cookie consent, another trick being used. And you've heard, actually, a lot of those that attended the talk about dark patterns, you've heard how many tricks are being used like this. The GDPR uh, then is defining how consent is given. And there are four requirements on the consent. So consent should be freely given. It should be unambiguous. Uh, the freely given here means that uh, you should have ch some choice. Here, you can click. Um, got it, what does it mean? What does it mean if I ignore this pop-up and I just leave it uh, be and I browse the website? Does it mean that I consented? That means that this was not, um, um, this was ambiguous because we are not sure what we are doing by interacting with this. It should be specific and informed. Um, that is, it should be clear to the user what is being consented and 
uh, the user uh, should understand that clearly. I will show more details. But another aspect here uh, is that GDPR defines that when data is being collected or used, it should be limited to certain purposes of the usage. So that is this purpose limitation uh, aspect. So then, therefore, you are sometimes seeing declared purposes and it should be limited really only to these processing purposes. Um, let's give you an example of some better notice, actually. Uh, so this particular notice, I will be using it a lot during this talk. And uh, the specificity here is implemented by giving you choices for concrete purposes here. Uh, the fact that it's informed is that you can click here, show details, and then you can actually read why these cookies are being used. And then the purpose limitation idea is really by separating the cookies, categorizing them into the different purposes and giving you choices in which you want and which not. This is still not ideal. Uh, the problem here is that by default, uh, these checkboxes are checked. So this means that it was by default opt-in that is still violating the law. But one can imagine that developers can also fix that and by default actually just uh, leave it uh, unchecked and therefore we can there's no problem with designing a proper consent yeah um, so is everything solved because we can uh, design a proper consent not really another problem is that actually the websites are not respecting what is being consented uh, to show that uh, let's play this video and Uh, we are visiting website for the first time and we are being asked for consent. So here you can see uh, the consent. Before we would even click agree, we just show you that everything was by default opt out, which is the correct implementation. Really everything uh, that takes a bit longer in the video because there are all the third parties listed and so, but everything is off. You see that there is nothing that we would agree to. We don't interact with the pop-up, but we look inside of the browser and now we can see that there are Google Analytics cookies already used, our other tracking cookies are used by this website. And this just shows that actually, even if you think that you honestly interact with the uh, consent, you opt out from everything, then you are still being tracked often. Uh, sorry. Um, a bit of uh, related work here, but uh, again, you don't have to read all on this slide, just an overview. There are plenty of studies that are showing how these consents are flawed. And one generic aspect here is that uh, more recent studies on the bottom are finding more problems. That is not because the websites would actually get worse, that is because the studies just look more into the, uh, this is more in-depth analysis, while the first studies were very shallow. Other aspect that I want to show here, the things that are in bold, those are showing the violations that are happening despite your interaction with the consent. So those are the cookies that are being, tracking you despite you rejected them or before you even interacted with the consent. So it is not novel, uh, I'm just one, next step in, this observa in these observations. Other direction are the dark patterns. So there were so many studies about dark patterns. The conclusion here is that they work. They work incredibly well. They trick, they nudge 90% uh, of users even more into agreeing with something that they would not like to agree. So if it would be called tracking consent, people would not agree that easily. And I would like to ask actually where in physical world you would see such significant level of non-compliance. So if the uh, regulations for cars would work the same as digital privacy regulations, then I would not be biking in, in to work because I would really be scared that with 90% of probability some car going on red will hit me. Um, and I'm not going to give you answer on why is this happening in the digital world? 
uh, maybe in the future I'm working on actually that, but at the moment I'm at least going to give you a solution to this. <laughs> so the goal of our work was to create a browser extension that classifies the cookies using machine learning and then removes the cookies as they are being created and therefore enforcing create a privacy for the users directly in the browser without need of cooperation of the website. So how uh, do we do that? And that is basically outlined for a significant part of this talk. Uh, we found a way how to collect training data set when, and then we extract features from this data, train the machine learning model and build a browser extension with this machine learning model included. Let's go into this, into steps. Data collection. I don't know if any one of you have experience with machine learning in the sense that they, you ever annotated a data set that you needed, but that is super annoying task. I did that and not for this project. Uh, it really is demanding task. So actually what was here nice is that we found some trick how to collect the data set already annotated. So I was showing you this consent and this consent was listing the cookie names here uh, assigned to the domains and then categorized. So here it is assigned to the statistical purpose. So that means that there are actually consents that are doing this uh, annotation for us. They are matching the cookies to the purposes. The problem is that they look very different. If we would have to design method how to collect this from all different types of consents, then it would be another huge task to actually find such method. Luckily, there are some basically libraries, JavaScript libraries that you can just include to your website and they do the consent for you. So these are third parties providing the consents for the websites. And these are then having the same interface on all the websites that are using them. And they are being used by like 2% of websites. And these are actually these three that I was showing here. So they are having the purposes they can serve for us as the source of the annotated data set. Um, and they also have the advantage that we don't even have to parse the text uh, to re extract it, but they have some uh, inner objects that are defining actually a list of cookies and assigned to the classes. So there are JSON files or other representations how we can get that in a uh, machine readable format. So not that much work needed. <clears throat> I did not mention really the purposes. I mentioned just one so far, and that was the legally defined strictly necessary cookies. And uh, that is really the only one that is defined by law. The others are de facto standards. So they are being proposed by this consents. Um, I sorry, I meant, forgot to mention that these are being called consent management platforms. I might be using sometimes the CMP abbreviation, but it, I will try to always use the long version because I don't like abbreviations. So these consent management platforms actually define these four purposes. So we just stick to that. But let me introduce them. Strictly necessary is something that is really needed. So your shopping basket on e-commerce website that is clearly needed or authentication cookie for your login that is needed. Functionality cookies are something that they define for changing settings of the website. So do you want to use dark mode? That will be stored often in functionality cookie. Sometimes this is being used also for switching languages, which I found a bit unfortunate, but um, they define that as functionality, not strictly necessary cookie. So these two are the cookies that you would like to have. Then, the remaining two categories, that is what the website wants. The website wants to collect some aggregated information about you. So then they can do alpha beta testing, what uh, thumbnail or what uh, article title is going to uh, increase the number of clicks or uh, just for some debugging purposes, those are often some performance and analytics cookies but they are collecting information aggregated over all the users. 
The most privacy uh, problematic types of cookies are these tracking advertising cookies. So then these are focusing on your individual actions and they are collecting create profile based on which they can uh, give you some targeted content or targeted advertisement. Um, so now we know the purposes, now we know where we are collecting the data, so just reporting on what we collected. We crawled uh, basically headless crawl, so without rendering the pages, we crawled six million websites and found that these particular content management platforms are being used on 37,000 of them. So that was fast detection. And then we crawled these 37,500 websites with uh, a full browser. So this particular library, OpenWPM, is used often for privacy studies. It contains very detailed information about uh, what is being created and so So detailed instrumentation, useful for us. And this crawl had the goals of detecting uh, the declared data. So uh, actually, the uh, cookies and their assignment based on the uh, consent. And then we also needed to observe the cookies actually used, because that is what is going to be classified. So we needed to really see the cookies, observe their content. Uh, so for that, we randomly browsed the website. So 10 random pages that we opened. Um, and we scrolled a bit, because often they track actually your mouse movement. And these are enabling a lot of cookies. So that was the interaction uh, that we did to uh, create the cookies such that we can observe them. And we had to make sure that we are actually consenting to all the cookies. We want to observe the cookies in this case. So there's a browser extension called Consentomatic that is built for these consent management platforms. And it automatically can reject or accept all cookies for these. So we used that one and made sure that we are consenting everything. Now, from this crawl of the 37,000 websites, roughly 30,000 reworked from them, we uh, found declaration to 2.2 million websites. So, two, uh, sorry, 2.2 million cookies. And then we also observed, so we're seeing the cookie being used, we observed uh, 600 cookies, uh, 600,000 cookies. And then the overlap of those two is actually just 323,000 cookies. So that is going to be our training data set. And the first issue here is that we are not observing uh, all the cookies that are being declared, which is uh, coming from two reasons. One is that these constants are being outdated. They are really having cookies that are not being used at all. But the main reason is actually that just our crawl is not able to do as detailed interaction with the website as real human. So as human, you can register to the website, you can change the settings, and that will enable a lot of cookies. But the crawl is agnostic of the content of the website. So it's not going to observe all the cookie and, and cookies, and that is quite some limitation of our work. But other problem here is actually that there are plenty of this, this green region. A lot of cookies that we uh, found, so we observed them, but they were not declared. And that is going to be something to which I will uh, return in the end of the talk, because that is basically a privacy violation. The consent is not complete. And I'm going to present you more types of privacy violations. Um, I can also just show that uh, the classes of these cookies that we found are highly imbalanced. So that is something that we have to deal with in our training and in our process. But they are mostly re most of the cookies on the internet are advertising uh, and analytics cookies. That was about the data collection. Now we need to extract some meaningful features. So we need to take the cookie, which is a name and some value and some other flags. We need to take that and we need to process it into some numerical representation that is suitable for the machine learning to train actually the prediction. So for that, what we did, 
we defined over 50 methods uh, that are using the expert knowledge here to extract something that the humans would see inside of the cookies. So we, when we see the cookie, we have some understanding as developers. So we tried to give these hints to the uh, machine learning model. And I'm not going to present 50 methods, so just four as an example. A lot of cookies, they contain some timestamps. So it can be uh, the Unix encoding, it can be human readable format, but the important thing is that it is often being used to track some information, like your first visit or your last uh, activity happened at this uh, timestamp, or your consent expires in uh, this time. So these cookies are going to be used, uh, this, parsing this will be then useful to find out uh, if something is potentially tracking you. Other content that we are seeing often in cookies are some uh, text that is saying this is language, so DE or EN, so it will be German or English, or it can be the currency and similar texts. And this is often being used in the functionality cookies. If cookie is supposed to track you, it needs to contain some randomness. It needs to be unique identifier, at least among the seven billion uh, people on our earth. So that means that you need at least something like 33 bits of entropy, of randomness in it. So we just measured the amount of randomness by different randomness metrics. Shannon entropy, we tried to compress it, all of these methods. And the last example is that the cookies are often not only simple name value pair, but it encodes some object. And then the co object can be encoded in JSON, it can be CSV, uh, it can be some other encoding. We detect that and we give this information uh, to the classifier. And we also look inside of the of uh, attributes if it's composed object and we even uh, extract a lot of features for the inner attributes. So this was really just a sneak into the uh, what is being extracted but there are many more methods. Now to the implementation of the classifier and before giving you immediately some results I will actually start with explaining some baselines such that you can make some sense from the results. There is manually annotated data set of cookies called Cookiepedia. This repository is actually maintained by one of the consent providers because they are using it to ease to the web maintainers the work of assigning the cookies to the purposes. They claim to have over 30 million cookies um, and from the perspective of our data set of the 323,000 cookies that we have, uh, they have so roughly 70% of this data set. And because it's being used by this same consent as we are uh, crawling, they are using also the same purposes. So we can then take this and basically say that this is a hard-coded model that is taking the cookie name and classifying it to the purpose. So we can take this as baseline of the R model. R model is a tree ensemble, uh, namely XGBoost. It just performed the best. I'm not going to uh, show you results, but we tried neural networks. We tried uh, also other traditional methods, but uh, ensemble, tree ensembles worked the best. And what such model does internally is that it is a decision tree, just a lot of them. And you take your current value, you ask, is it a session cookie? And if not, then you go to the left. Is it having entropy higher than 0 0.8, whatever it means for the model? If it's true, then you get to the result. And that is then, based on this, is assigned the probability of the class. This was very, very brief intro into what is actually XGBoost. But um, this model worked really well. And the comparison is that 
if we take the baseline as Cookiepedia, uh, which is basically human experts trying to classify cookies, and if we compare it directly to our model, then our model is achieving comparable or slightly higher accuracy. So we are outperforming here already human expertise, or at least at the level of the human expertise. If you want more details, then these are confusion matrices to those that are uh, into machine learning. And uh, to those, I want to just show that um, this is showing what types of misclassification the models are doing. And for example, if a cookie is necessary, but it's going to be classified as advertising, then it's going to appear here. And what I want to show is that our model is doing fewer of the more extreme mistakes. So if you would like to keep just the necessary and functional cookies and remove analytics and advertising, then the Cookiepedia would even make more misclassifications from that where we are having here fewer misclassifications. We are even like training the model with the goal of not being way too far off. Like misclassifying something necessary to functional is more okay than misclassifying something necessary to advertising and vice versa. Um, the performance won't get over 91%. We evaluated that by just finding that our data set is containing a lot of noise, uh, roughly 9% of noise. And that is something that I'm going to and get back to because the noise is a, another type of privacy violations that we observed. So we trained a model and now just we need to create the browser extension. Uh, the problem was that uh, there are no libraries for machine learning models for uh, JavaScript or for JavaScript you get them, but not really for the API that is allowed by browsers. So we had to re-implement still XGBoost prediction for uh, JavaScript and browser extension, but that was done, Dino was doing a lot. And then he created this browser extension cookie block. And the functionality of this is that when you install it, then it's going to ask you for basically one more consent. You will select the, uh, the categories that you would like to remove and that you would like to keep. That is going to be the last consent that you should give. After that, as you are browsing, it categorizes the cookies using the model and removes them within 10, 15 milliseconds. Um, it does not remove the pop-ups. So we are not doing that because there are other browser extensions doing that. There is uh, uBlock origin that allows you to install filter for specifically the pop-ups. Uh, that is my preference, but there is also browser extension. I don't care about cookies. That only purpose of that is actually it's removing the pop-ups. So if you want to just remove the pop-ups, that is the extension to go. But if you are only removing the pop-ups, then some cookies are still going to track you. Uh, so that is the goal of the cookie block, and we left these functionalities separated and not re-implemented these extensions. One more aspect, maybe not that important for you here, is that it works for everyone and everywhere. So uh, it is language agnostic, and also it is uh, region agnostic. It doesn't matter that only European Union is having that strong privacy regulations. It works also for US, it works in Asia, in South America, everywhere they, where they don't have privacy regulations that would protect the users. And that effect is actually called Brussels effect that uh, the European regulations that are advanced also in like climate change are then affecting the whole world. And uh, the whole world is benefiting from them even that we are a bit beta testers of such regulations. So I think that this is a nice example here that we are also exporting the privacy. Um, we evaluated this by browsing using cookie block 100 websites. And 85% uh, of them worked 
uh, without any problem. So everything was as expected. We really tried to register to the websites. We changed some settings. We did everything that was possible. But the problem here is that uh, the, some of the websites were broken. And this is the sad truth about our extension. So seven websites, uh, it was impossible to either register or we were losing the authentication session. So that is, of course, a uh, usability issue. And that is something that we are addressing by maintaining a list of exceptions. Mostly currently now I'm maintaining this list of exceptions. So people are reporting to us broken websites and then uh, I'm just spending the time finding which cookie is the broken one and I'm granting the exception and then everyone is uh, having the information built in the browser extension to ignore such cookie, don't remove it. Eight websites were broken for some other reason. Uh, seven times it was the consent that was reappearing, even that user consented, the cookie that was storing the consent was uh, being removed. That is something that doesn't matter if you are using the browser extensions to remove the consent. So that is not that big deal. Unfortunately, one website, it was impossible to switch the language. So that is also something that I'm trying to fix. Um, you can get this extension in the browser stores. So you can get it for Chrome, for Firefox, Opera, uh, Edge, but it's not for Safari because Safari API did not allow removal of individual cookies. Uh, it's being changed, so maybe in half year we will have open Safari. Um, it's still, I think, I'm not sure about that, uh, but it's not for Safari at the moment. But so far we have 7,000 users and we have small, small community. It's mostly me, Dino, uh, who are maintaining it, but we got two people committing to the repository also translation to other languages. So Spanish and Japanese was translated by users. We have over 100 reviews if we include all the stores and also our form for feedback. And average rating is like four. Unfortunately, we have people that are like one star, it broke one website for me and they are unhappy, which, yeah, the Cookie, the extension is breaking some websites. It's unfortunate, but I want to be clear about that. Uh, so just know that we are being warned, but it's protecting the privacy. There is some utility privacy trade-off between this. Um, the maintenance is time demanding. I'm having some other projects <laughs> along this, but this would take almost like one third of my working week if I would work on it all the time. Uh, and I'm now a bit behind. So a lot of feedback from users after it was covered with media. So that is the challenging part. And if there are people that are interested in contributing to open source and you would like this extension, then I'm happy to explain you how my, I, I'm defining the exceptions. And I would be happy to see actually people helping with this, not only the translation, even that it was very nice. Mm, here, demonstration of how it works. So again, the same problematic website, yeah? And uh, after, in so after installation, you will select what purposes you would like, and then we will navigate to the same news website. And um, this time, again, we are not interacting with the consent, but we are looking into the storage, and there is no Google Analytics cookie anymore. There is this one underscore GAT and that cookie is a session cookie and it's not tracking you because it is having value one. So it's not having enough entropy to track you. It is really just to store the consent, which was not given finally, but it is storing that the consent was given, which is just the bug on this website. So it is being removed. Um, again, yeah. I hinted to you a few times that we are also detecting some privacy violations. So it is from the same data set of the websites. So namely only from these websites that are using these specific consent management platforms. And we uh, defined eight methods to gather evidence for 
potential privacy violations. Potential just because it needs court decision to say if something is privacy violation. The shocking result for those that are not in the field, not the shocking for those that read the previous work, is that almost 95% of websites are having at least one privacy violation. Let's go through some of them. Maybe I actually have time for going through all of them. So one, the one most commonly used cookie in the internet is Google Analytics cookies. Almost 70% of websites is using them. They should be statistical. So they are collecting aggregated information on users. And the problem is not that much if they misclassify it as advertising tracking that is only going to harm them. But the problem is if they are classifying it as strictly necessary where you cannot uh, object to this. And that is something that is happening by 2.7% of websites. And this was by court decided that this is real violation. But this one serves more as example. Now, generalizing this case, there are cookies that are being defined by multiple websites because they are third party cookies. So different websites are defining the same cookie. And then we can basically let the websites vote what is the purpose of the cookie. And uh, if then some of them disagree, then we can say that there are at least some of them being wrong. And we found that at least 30% of websites are having cookie that is disagreeing, assigned to purpose that is disagreeing with other uh, websites, what they are saying. This might be actually, we can be wrong. It can be that the majority is being wrong, but this is giving us the lower bound, at least on this type of violation, potential violation. Some cookies are being uh, assigned to multiple purposes. It doesn't really comply with the idea by GDPR to separate the purposes, but it is not that big deal if it would be implemented correctly, such that if you disagree with one of the purposes, the cookie would not be used. Unfortunately, if you agree just with one of them, it is already being used. But it's not happening that often. 2.3% of websites. Um, then some of these uh, consents are having also category unclassified. The problem is that there is not, no checkbox for unclassified, so you cannot object to this. And that is something that 25% of websites are having unclassified cookies, which is rather ignorance by the developers to not reassign them, but the problem is you cannot object them is there. So that is another thing that we report. Fifth method, the most common, was actually what I already uh, hinted once. And that is that we are observing a lot of cookies that are not being declared at all. And roughly 40% of cookies are being uh, used by the websites and not appearing in the consent at all. And it is more than 80% of websites having such cookies. Again, more the ignorance of the developers. And um, maybe they are just not aware. So this is another problem because your consent is not informed then. You are consenting with something that you were not given the right information. Sixth method, if I show here. So cookies itself are having as one of the attributes they are having expiry. And by law, they were also required these consents to inform about the expiry. So that is the reason why here is the column about expiry. We can just simply compare these two values. And if there is significantly uh, mismatch, the real expiry is significantly lower, then we are reporting that as another potential violation found roughly on 13.5% of websites. Last two methods are not novel by us. They were actually in the prior work but we can very well remeasure them. So the cookies that are being set before you consent, that is the independent page that I was showing in the two videos. They are being used by almost 70% of websites. And that is uh, agreeing with one previous study, but very disagreeing with other. And last is when you provide the consent, you object to some of the purposes and these cookies 
that are for these purposes are actually still being used. That is something that is on one fifth of websites. And again, our measurement is very different from previous studies. So maybe it's happening more or maybe their study was flawed. If I just show all of them together, it looks roughly like this. So you see different problems differently often. But if I aggregate them together and say how many potential violations are there on websites, then you can see only 5.3% of websites not having any problems at all. And then you see that a lot of websites are having multiple problems. So really it is happening a lot of stuff on multiple websites. And also this is just of these eight types. So the maximum here is eight. But uh, if we would take into account every single cookie that is a potential violation of some problem, we would be with numbers that would be like 50 and something like that. There are websites that are having 100 undeclared cookies. Um, our future goals with this project is actually uh, two directions. One is that we want to prevent websites doing this. So we cooperate with the data protection agencies. If someone here would be actually from data protection agency, connect with me, please, because uh, we are happy to give the data to these. So far, we are cooperating just with one. Um, and we also provide them, we are working on auditing version of the browser extension. That would be more generic, and that would allow basically faster for them to check if something is a real problem or not. Um, we also try to detect these potential violations on more websites, not only on these websites that are using the concrete CMPs, uh, consent management platforms, but on generic websites, which needs some generalization, natural language processing, and so. The other direction is something that I hinted as well. We would like to understand why is this happening. And one direction is that we want to have continuous measurements and see if new regulations are helping and improving the situation, such that we can give feedback to the lawyers, because the lawyers are not having this feedback. They would like to propose something that would work. So this is the goal that we have here. The other is understand actually how the different consent providers are shaping then the generic consent. So if one of them is having some feature, is it going to be implemented by others? Okay, I'm getting to the end. So we can clearly see that cookie consents are broken or tracking consents are broken. And if we want to prevent it now, it has to be enforced at the client side, so in the browser. What we did towards that was that we crawled data set of cookies with the purposes, extracted the features for them, trained a machine learning model that is categorizing them, and built a browser extension that includes this, so this cookie block. And along that, we uh, also found evidence for a lot of potential violations, 85% websites having some problems. That's everything. Thank you for your attention. Your questions. <laughs>
in the future um, have less problems with this. Thanks for the question. I totally agree that it is a reason why we have underrepresented uh, strictly necessary cookies. And uh, it is a big problem why websites are being broken. Um, we are now going rerunning crawl uh, after quite some time, and we want to include also the labels from the manual exceptions. But the exceptions are working as hardcoded data set that is being into account, taken into account before the classification happens. So it is a, a JSON file that is just saying, this cookie is having this purpose. Don't even try to classify it. And it is up to me or do you know, to assign this purpose from looking into the privacy uh, policy. And one more thing that you asked, how when can we improve the crawler? In other projects, I'm doing a crawler that might be more problematic to say that is actually automating registration to websites because we want to inspect also authenticated sections for different privacy problems. And joining the projects would be nice, but that other crawl is extremely expensive in just running. Like it's running 10 times longer than this one. Uh, so yeah, eventually my crawlers, my projects hopefully will merge, but at the moment it's not happening. Yeah, which is causing this limitation. You talked about the CMPs, how do they work? Like, are you downloading a library, uh, configure it and deploy it on your website? Or are you embedded and send personal data to maybe a US company? Uh, you are directly embedding it in your website, so it's a third party, and you are maintaining it then through the uh, website because a lot of them are paid, so you pay the subscription fee, and this way you maintain everything through the website of the consent management platform. Um, so everything is set up there, and everything is contained by them, and also if it's uh, going to this company, it it's totally happening. Well, there was there. First of all, thank you for solving this important problem. Um, how big would you rate the risk that um, the companies adopt their cookies to um, not get caught by your trained algorithm? If we have 7,000 uh, users, then I'm not that afraid. Um, but of course, they can use the adversarial machine me learning methods to create cookies that would evade the detection. I would, at the moment, I would actually address it by saying that law would be very unhappy for them doing this. So I think that their legal team would actually decide like this is not a good thing to try to evade this. I think that they would really be risking more than they can benefit from it. Um, in long term, uh, we can use methods that are preventing adversarial machine learning. So actually, our model is not that susceptible to adversarial machine learning, while neural networks would be much worse. Um, but it would harm, again, the accuracy of the model. So that is something that we, at the moment, decided we just ignore uh, this possibility and we go with the best possible accuracy that we can get. Any more questions? So kind of from the implementation side, uh, having probably set cookies that might have required consent, a very specific question. So if I set a preference cookie, like your language example, is that something, if I don't set any tracking cookies, anything like that, do I need a consent banner for that? or? And would that also explain the kind of uh, unclassified cookies because developers think, oh, this is just a preference that the user can directly manipulate, so I don't need to get consent, I don't even need to list it? So they should not leave things unclassified, they should say that it is strictly necessary. And I think that it is uh, some obscurity created by the uh, there's actually a consortium of the consent management platforms, so I think that uh, the functionality class is not beneficial for the users and it should be strictly necessary. So if your website is using cookie to switch language, please use it as strictly necessary, you don't need any consent. At least that's my 
perception here. Like to me, this is free functionality of the website. I would like to have this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks for the talk. And among the CMPs you looked at, were there any that, relatively speaking, produce less violations than others? Who? Um, I'm not having data on this at the moment. Um, so. I would have like personal preference which one of them are having like more user friendly implementation than others, but I think that most of the violations are stemming from uh, the ignorance of the developers or just uh, not awareness of what they should get consent for. So uh, the API here, these types of violations, they are not probably man much influenced by that, but I, sorry, I don't have data, like hard data for this to say it. Some of them, for example, don't have the unclassified class. So then of course that type of potential violation is not happening. So thank you for the talk. Uh, what about uh, scrambling the cookie contents instead of deleting them? So, um, if you would only uh, interact with the cookie consent, then you are still dependent on the website to then implement the cookies accordingly. So the last two types of potential violations, so these two are uh, dependent on the implementation and of the website, independent of the consent. This is really something, some cookies that are being used before you consent and namely these ones are the most important that you would not get rid of. So these are cookies that are uh, being used after the, you provide consent. And also all these cookies that are being misclassified, you would, um, and they actually were not for us detected as privacy violation because uh, we just considered the labels given by the developers as given, but there are many misclassified and cookie block will prevent also these problems. I, I think the last question was about the idea of um, disturbing website owners by providing them noisy data instead of no data. Um, so that your extension would not delete the cookie but instead write something else inside the cookie. Um, but I, have a, I actually have a question on my own. Um, um, I'm interested in, in, in your training. Um, so you said you had, it's like around 350 cookies, right, that you had in your training set. Um, how many samples did you have? So how many different values on average did you have for each of the cookies? And also about the features, um, did you also use the name of the cookie as a, a part of the features? So 350,000 cookies that we have in the training data set. Um, the uh, we extract uh, some things from the name, so we parse the name for like tokens because it is often like camel case or some other representation. Then we have uh, back of words for the most common names and we give that to the machine learning model to do whatever it wants with it. So we are not saying that if it contains tracking, then store that as a feature. We are just simply letting the feature extraction to say it contains tracking in the name. Uh, sorry, the other question that was in the beginning, I might have skipped that. And how, how many values did you observe per cookie? Like you had 350,000 cookies? So the question. Did you have per cookie? Yeah. Per cookie? Can you please repeat the question? <laughs> so how many labels we observed per uh, or how many layers? How many different samples? Like you had a cookie named ABC and you saw it like five times or like ten times? How many times? Ah, okay, so how many times we observed the same name of the cookie? So for us, uniquely we interpret cookie as a combination of the name and the domain. So we use that as uh, unique uh, representations. That actually is a big difference from the Cookiepedia and that is why we did not use data from them because they are taking just name and they directly go with the purpose, which is the problem then one website can use cookie user ID for tracking while other is using it for authentication. And those are absolutely the opposite uh, goals. So there are cookies like the Google Analytics that we found on uh, really a lot of websites and then 
that roughly 8% they disagreed from the statistical, but apart from these cookies that are the third party, um, we are not having the measurement on how many times they are appearing because they are unique for every website. Um, I have a question by myself. So this is by origin a legal question as such, these uh, content uh, things and GDPR. So do you have any legal people in your team or somehow? So in this particular work, uh, we published it without lawyers because I learned from other projects that publishing with lawyers means that I'm ha even that I'm going to meeting with some questions, I'm, uh, I'm going out with more questions that I had. Uh, so it was just easier to publish it without lawyers. But we have cooperation with lawyers, two law professors and postdoc and PhD students that are involved in other projects and I'm sometimes um, trying to get their feedback on this. So um, I have a lot of legal guidance from them and my overview of the law is actually from them a lot. Are there any more questions? You mentioned something about an auditing tool. Uh, what's the status about this? I think it would be quite nice for a website hosters to check if uh, everything is all right. Yeah, um, the time, so um, I'm supervising master student working on that. I'm not implementing it myself. And uh, the progress is that uh, we first had to implement cookie block actually for uh, the new browser extension API, which was unfortunately updated and it harms a lot of privacy extensions. And now we are also detecting a lot of additional things that then the developer does not need to provide to us. So we are trying to automate the auditing process as much as possible. And for that reason, it's not available yet. And it will, some first version will be out in August. So definitely in August, I will upload it to my website to link to that. But the final version, the end of the uh, project of the student is uh, end of September. So please stay uh, connected with me if you want to have it. Or if you are interested, you can be beta tester actually. And that would be nice also for the student. But at the moment, it's not released. More questions? Well, I think there were already quite a lot of questions and yes, you did very well answering more or less all of them, <laughs> so thank you. So this was uh, Karel Kubitschek and I hope we can hear more about all this uh, in some future years. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the attention. If you would like to have it, then you can just search for the cookie block name simply. Uh, or everything else is available from my website or on GitHub, but uh, everything is now quite well by all the search engines.